Um, good morning, um, well, afternoon, evening, everywhere. Um, welcome to today's Design and Dialogue. We have a 45 minutes conversation with Cindy Strauss from Houston, um, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. So please feel free to put down your questions in the chat box. We're also recording this for archive purpose. Um, we're also muting everyone um, just to ensure background clarity. So let's turn to Glenn Adamson. Thank you very much, Lucy. Good morning to you, Cindy, and hello, Houston. Hello, Glenn, and everyone. Hey, great to see you. Um, just to uh, repeat something Lucy said there, because it's important to put your questions in the chat box as we talk, and then we'll loop back to them at the end in our last 15 minutes of conversation. And also, if you don't mind letting us know where you're zooming in from, we'd love to see that, just to see where people are geographically. Presumably we have more Texans than usual today. Um, and Cindy, the first question I wanted to ask you, because I know a lot of people are wondering about it, is about the MFA's experience of reopening, because at least as far as I know, you're the first major museum in America to reopen its doors after the initial wave of the coronavirus crisis. And just wondering how that's going for you all. Sure, yeah, we, we are the first major museum. And we reopened last week, uh, Wednesday for members and then Saturday for the public with um, an inordinate amount of safety uh, measures in place. You have to have your temperature taken, um, masks are required, we are cashless, so we have people purchasing tickets, printing them online at home and um, then scanning them. Uh, we've got, you know, all the, the shields up at the membership desk and in the shop, our cafe is closed. Things have gone really smoothly. And, um, you know, none of us were really sure how many people would come, uh, but we've been averaging about 500 people a day. Um, for our capacity, we can have as many as 900 people in the buildings at once. Um, so we haven't gotten to what our, our current capacity limits are, but we found that people are happy. You know, there are, are people who come to the museum every week. They're happy to be back. There are people who are just embracing the fact that um, art is available and, and our director, Gary Tintero and the staff feel very strongly that art can really serve a role in times like this. And it's part of our mission to be open. So mm -hmm. thanks for asking. We're, uh, we're doing really well. We've canceled, you know, tours and public programs. So, and audio tours, you know, the obvious kinds of things, but, um, and limited our hours a little bit, instead of opening at 10, we're opening at 11 and we're uh, open, we're closed Mondays and Tuesdays right now during Corona. Okay, well, it sounds like it's going really well so far, which is fantastic. And I see a lot of folks actually from Houston are chiming in and also uh, no less than Caroline Bowman, who is uh, the former director at the Cooper Hewitt has just sent her congratulations in the chat on your reopening. So thanks for that, Caroline. Uh, Cindy, if you don't mind getting the images up, we can go ahead and plunge right in. What we're gonna be talking about which is a great subject, is building one of the great collections of design uh, that exists in any American museum now, or indeed any world museum. And one of the extraordinary things about this, Cindy, is that you've had the chance to build it essentially from scratch um, in your years at the museum. And remind me, when did you come to the MFAH? So I came in fall of 1994 as a curatorial assistant, and um, my Predecessor Catherine Howe, I see, is on the Zoom today, so a lot of this will be familiar to her. Kath hired me um, as a curatorial assistant, and um, one of the things that I was working on at the very beginning, I sort of had a dual role. One um, with Rienzi, one of our house museum collections, which is uh, 18th century, but then also working on developing um, a then uh, modern and contemporary or in 20th century collection. Um, Kath had built a really strong collection through uh, arts and crafts and had also um, made some acquisitions in, um, in modern, um, but there wasn't necessarily a directed collecting plan for this area. 
And so um, I was promoted to assistant curator in 1997. And um, that's when I was able to really start um, working sincerely on a, on a plan um, for this collection. And Peter Marzio, my then director, was extremely encouraging um, about seeing what we could do in this area and um, understanding my argument for why we should be collecting. And he let me found a friends group for it uh, in 1998 and, and sort of uh, you know, the rest is history. So we're really um, going to be looking at the fruits of almost 25 years of curatorial effort here. So it's, it's quite a track record. Um, and I guess yeah. just, you're just starting, Cindy. <laughs> we're gonna see how, oh, no. how you have done already. Um, and if you wanna go ahead and start taking us through the images, sure. I guess maybe a good place to start is just to say what your first moves were um, when you first started building this collection, obviously knowing that there was a historic decorative arts collection, as you said, Rienzi, also the Bayou Bend collection mm -hmm. of early American decorative yeah. so not, not going from zero but certainly um no certainly with... not and and Kath's um area of specialty was late 19th century american you know going into arts and crafts and so there was a very strong collection in terms of that i should say for um those people who are on and don't know our collection um we're only talking about the design side today um we have an incredible incredibly important, robust craft program um, that I think is better known um, to the general public than our design collection is at this moment, mostly because of the major collections, uh, Helen Williams Drutt collection of jewelry, the Garth Clark and uh, Mark Del Vecchio collection of ceramics, the Lee and Mel Eagle collection of craft, um, those that we've had major traveling exhibitions and catalogs um, mm. of, of those areas. And uh, so that's, that's probably what a lot of people know. But we, um, so today we're just focusing on, on design. And I just, this first slide just quickly shows you the range of things that we collect. Ceramics, metalwork, textiles, furniture, glass, graphic design, lighting, wallpaper, fashion, uh, installation, product design, and a lot of, of things in between. So we have been building a collection that is, is wide ranging. And I think one of the, the benefits to, it's a double-edged sword when you start mostly you know, from scratch, is that you want everything. Uh, you can't have everything, both from a financial perspective as well as from the perspective that things aren't necessarily available. So uh, it was really important to make sure that through acquisitions, we could represent the major movements in design history to be able to tell the story, um, but also have a distinct identity for this collection. I have never been interested in having um, a cookie cutter collection that looks like other museums, um, knowing that there, of course, are going to be certain designers and objects that are going to be iconic that you must have. Um, so th that was really important to be able to, to develop a, a personality um, and an identity for the collection. The, um, the best place to start, now after we ran this, sorry, Lucy, now I can't seem to, to make it go forward. You may need to just click on the image field and then it might go. Yep, you're right. So thank you. So um, here is uh, one of our buildings. I wanted to start with it. The, the image on the right is how it looks today. On the left is how it looked in the late 1950s. Um, the MFA has always been incredibly progressive in terms of its architecture. And uh, in 1954, hired Ms. Vanderilla to do the first of what would become two editions. Uh, so the one that you see on the left is the way the museum looked in 1958 with the original Cullen and Hall edition. And then um, in 1968, Mies is called back to refine a master plan. And um, his office continues after his death. And in 1974, we have the Brown Pavilion, 
that is opened. So one of the first things um, that I think in terms of the research was, you know, having to do with getting objects that reflected the interests of our institution and the campus. And so the, the image that you see here on the left is um, Cullinan Hall, that 1958 opened uh, interior, which not surprisingly, Mies outfitted with his own designed furniture. Um, we are in a remarkable position because the pieces that he specced from Knoll, um, particularly the Barcelona chairs, he did not like the flat pancake uh, cushions that came with them. So he had his office create the kinds of cushions that were on the original um, chairs, so tufted, deeper. Um, so we have accessioned some um, examples from that 1958 furniture, but what you see on the right um, is a Nice Barcelona chair from the first year of manufacture that was um, bought at auction in 1997 and was something that um, Kath Howe was really instrumental with um, because she had been saving funds for like, I don't know, a decade maybe for something, you know, really, really major. Um, so it made sense that we have an important um, early example that reflected Mises original vision, not only with the horsehair thick button tufted cushions, but the way um, what you can't see in this image is uh, the leather straps are, are slight different colors um, rather than just one color. It's very subtle. And then these lap over joints um, because there wasn't the technology to have it welded um, at this time. So that um, kind of thing also inspired um, research on my part um, about more things in the museum history. And these are just remarkable images. On the, the left, or excuse me, the right, you see um, what was a men's smoking room in the 1940s, completely outfitted in all of our Alto furniture. Sadly, none of it survived. Um, and you can see in the upper left how we even use this furniture as gallery uh, seating in the nascent uh, years of the museum's installation. Uh, so that really, you know, led me to, you know, I, I was interested op if in Alto for all the obvious reasons, but this connection to the museum. And then in the lower left-hand corner, you see an installation shot from um, 1954 when the museum was one of 40 museums on the design and uh, Scandinavia exhibition tour, which I'm sure uh, everyone is, those of you who were on the call uh, last week with Bobby and Monica, um, you know, heard about that show. Um, at the end of our venue, um, we had the ambassador from Finland uh, donated four objects out of the exhibition. And one of my very first uh, tasks as a curatorial assistant was to identify what had been um, cataloged as paperweights and turned out to be incredibly rare and important um, tapio vercola and Timo Sarpaneva glass designs um, that were donated at that time. So um, this interest in Scandinavian, um, the fact that early on in the 40s and 50s, Scandinavian design was available in Houston and people collected it, kind of led um, us to prioritize that. Um, the Alto uh, Paimio armchair on the left I looked for this for 20 years. Um, it's very, very important to our collecting philosophy to acquire works as close to the original design date as possible in as original condition. And this um, actually retains its label from the manufacturer whose uh, name I am not going to pronounce. Um, <laughs> but uh, through that kind of research, um, we've been able to um, not to pinpoint manufacturing dates. And so you'll see on our labels at our museum, we always have a design date and a manufacturer date. 
Um, I feel really strongly that if we're going to put something out and say this is important and worthy of being in a museum, that it needs to be as close to the original um, inspiration as possible because mm. we discovered over the years that, um, you know, as efficiencies in manufacturing or materials change that, that objects actually um, change significantly, sometimes change really significantly as they go on. So we, we don't acquire any later additions or reproductions or however you want to describe those things. That's a very interesting feature of your collecting practices. And I guess it does speak to the value of the Houston MFA collection as a reference collection, I guess one could say, because you're obviously um, registering a lot of information there when you collect those early works. And I, I guess um, it prompts a question for me as to whether you sometimes get back from people who think that because design is serially manufactured, it's a bit irrational <laughs> or you know somehow a waste of time to be applying those kinds of restrictive connoisseurial tests to objects in the way that you might for let's say an 18th century piece of furniture so do you have questions coming to you about that kind of um priority that you're yeah saying? i mean we do all the time um and my standard answer to people is you know for every example that that people kind of throw at me, like, why does it matter with this object? I can, um, you know, push back with something else. So the, the Alto vase that you see here is a perfect example. Um, this one is from 1937. It's part of a handful um, that were made as a um, commemorative um, gift to Finnish journalists who were visiting the factory to see uh, you know, the new glass blowing. Um, and they gave each one of these journalists one of these vases, so it's dated on the, with the September date, 1937, on it. Um, the story, based on one of the Finnish newspapers, is that the majority of the journalists um, didn't like this newfangled glass and chucked them out the train window. <laughs> <laughs> but some survived, um, and so we had been waiting for an early one. You know, the new, um, the Savoy vases that Itala makes today, they're great things. I have one in my house, but it is a rigid industrial piece of glass. It doesn't have this fluid, watery, I mean, you wouldn't mistake one for the other. And so um, for me, it's a perfect example of, of, the importance of why to get an original one. And I tell people, if you just want to have these great designs in your house, who cares? Get the recent edition. I mean, they're still great designs. But if you're trying to form a serious collection, it's something that you need to take into consideration. And again, as a museum, um, especially because I work in an encyclopedic art institution, and the way um, Peter Marzio wanted to think about all um, departments is that we all have to stand up to each other. So, you know, uh, every department has their Rembrandts, every, you know, some of the, the, the better known, you know, paintings for the public. And if we're going to put things on view, they should have the same uh, importance and integrity as, as every other artistic medium. And, um, you know, like prints, um, Peter used to always say that manufactured design is a slippery slope. And so we have to hold ourselves, um, he encouraged us to hold ourselves to a, um, a really tough standard. And so um, that is some, the way I was trained. And um, there's probably no one who's tougher on a potential acquisition um, in our museum than I am, you know, next to our, our photography and print, you know, those of us who really deal with multiples. So by the time it even gets to my acquisitions committee or to Gary, I've already, you know, tried to poke a zillion holes into it to make sure it does what it needs to do. Mm, that's fascinating. So the, the very fact that you're operating in this slippery slope kind of discipline almost prompts more rigor. I think for the the um, the mass-produced things, especially things that have been in production for a very long time, you know, if something's mass-produced and it was only in production for ten years, then it's you know, 
it's not quite the same as if something's been in production for 40 or 50 years. Mm. And well, I, I, yeah, I'll just keep going. Um, yeah. Just to say that, um, you know, our Scandinavian design collection, we, through the collecting efforts, you know, we've done uh, focus looks at, uh, you know, various aspects of it. So this is an area um, which a lot of museums haven't collected um, for whatever reason. Our collection, the strength of it is really 1920s through 1970s, but increasingly we're trying to um, broaden that collection um, and get the sort of once in a lifetime um, acquisitions to dovetail with the more um, production oriented pieces such as um, the Saarinen armchair, which is uh, one of 12 done for an industrial client of um, Saarinen's, a major um, mansion in Helsinki that, uh, that we acquired a few years ago. Um, at the very beginning also, I really wanted to focus on contemporary design, design that was happening right at that moment. So, you know, I was always, I've always been looking to the future to say whoever inherits this department 50 years from now, um, what will they have? Um, and the real contemporary design was um, a very easy and honestly inexpensive um, way. So, you know, we were an early museum to collect drogue. Um, Rennie Romacher's Marcel Launders came in 1997 to give lectures here. Uh, there was an architect in Houston who showed in um, the 1996 Drogue exhibition in Milan. So again, we had um, additional reasons for these um, connections. Um, the Paul Quadden's chair, you know, I think uh, a lot of New Yorkers will remember material connection. Um, and all the great shows that they did um, around new materials. Both Kath and I have seen this chair, which was at the time the world's lightest chair, weighed less than two pounds, um, completely out of, of carbon fiber and Kevlar. And then, you know, as we kind of increased into the late 1990s, starting to um, have acquisitions that were more, you know, very limited additions showing the new techniques, um, processes, we were able to acquire these things really, really early on. And so they were really inexpensive. Um, and uh, that was something that we were able to, to really sort of focus on. And we've continued that to really try and keep up with contemporary design and do a balance of you know, interesting production things as well as um, more signature uh, limited pieces as you see here. Can I ask yeah. a kind of difficult question? Um, yeah. so how do you think about rigor in the context of collecting contemporary objects? Because mm -hmm. one could say that by the time you came along, no, you, know, you didn't need to be told that Mies van der Rohe and Alvar Aalto were important, but particularly since you were an early adopter of some of these practices, as you're saying, I, and obviously the collection um, connoisseurship issues with respect to condition aren't necessarily um, a factor because you have relatively new production and you can interview the designers and so on. And of course, there's a great deal of archival value to doing that because of that interchange. But mm -hmm. how did you actually impose a kind of rigor on the collecting of contemporary works in a way that paralleled what you were doing in the more historic side? You know, it's really hard and part of it is really um, amorphous. <laughs> um, you know, Peter Marzio used to say to me, for those curators who collect contemporary, if uh, in 50 years you've had a, someone can look back and say you had a 25% success rate, then you are an amazing curator. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the trick is, is you hope that um, you're using all the information that you have gleaned about um, whether it's something that is using a new technology, a reinvention of form, um, new materials. It has to have visual, really strong visual presence, um, first of all, and it should say something about its time period and then you layer in the, the other kinds of questions that you would ask of an object. Um, the hope is always you're spending less money 
um, than you are on the uh, historical things. And so if you're right, fabulous. If you're wrong, you haven't, you know, sunk the boat. Um, we all can't be right, you know, all the time. And um, so I, it is a little bit amorphous. I personally think it's extremely important to be collecting design of the moment. But I would tell you that I am more careful. Maybe careful is not the right word. I'm, if I'm rigorous about other areas, I'm a little bit more rigorous and a little bit slower um, maybe mm -hmm. about some of um, this. But I, I can also tell you, and this is not gonna be helpful for anybody, but um, I really have confidence in my, my eye and my ability to make decisions. And when I know it's right for that moment, it's right and I will pursue it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, the hope is, is that somebody's going to come in here, you know, 25 years from now and be like, wow, she was really off base or, you know, hey, it's really great that we had these things and we're not retroactively trying to acquire them for more money. Can I ask you just one other question about that, Cindy, which just has to do with your peer institutions and indeed your mm -hmm. peers, other curators, um, because I also wonder, well, I suppose there's a a balance to be struck between um, thinking about the group, uh, the kind of verification that happens because of group assessments of what's happening in the field and somebody like the Campana brothers or Martin Boss rising to the top of what people are talking about and thinking about, but mm -hmm. you also want to be in a position of following the pack. And I wonder how you sort of balance that out in, in terms of what you're looking at at other museums, what they're collecting, what they're exhibiting. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say with the contemporary, um, it's less looking at what other museums are collecting. Um, I generally go to Milan every year. Um, and I, you know, there are galleries that specialize in contemporary design all over the world that I keep up with. Um, with Campana Brothers, for example, um, we started collecting around like 98 or 2000, some of the early production pieces they did. So it was kind of a natural um, growth to, you know, start collecting things like the Black Iron Chair when it was more, um, more limited edition. So, and that's because I saw their very, you know, one of their first big shows at Milan in was like, I don't know, whatever year it was, it was sometime in the 90s um, that I saw it in person. And, and so I, you know, I have to say, while you know, I'm very close to a lot of my peers at other museums, um, I don't really talk about acquisitions that much um, with them, not mm -hmm. because of any, for contemporary, not because of anything with competition. Um, I'm always curious what my colleagues are doing, but um, the conditions at many of my colleagues' museums are different, you know, whether it's like the Cooper Hewitt, which is a design museum and can collect a whole range of design that is just not right for an encyclopedic art institution. Mm. Um, so I guess, uh, I don't know if I'm fully answering your question, but I, I, I have to say I, I sort of march to the beat of my own drummer um, mm -hmm. with, with a lot of this. I have total respect for what my colleagues are doing. Um, but I, I, when it comes to planning for contemporary acquisitions, I'm not as much focused on who is doing what. Mm. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, moving along, sort of quickening up our pace about um, some of the initiatives we've done. Um, I, we raise all of our own money, uh, curators at the museum. Um, some departments have endowments. Um, our department has this tiny endowment that throws off about $5,000 a year. Um, and so it's, and we do have access to major endowments with uh, Gary Tindero's approval. But uh, in 2000, we entered a partnership with our Houston chapter of the American Institute of Architects. Um, one of my acquisition committee members was um, her business partner was president of the AIA in Houston and AIA was very interested in expanding their audience's definitions of what architects do. Uh, we have two architecture schools in Houston plus 
3,000 members of the AIA, commercial and residential and engineers and all of that. So we started this, um, what became kind of a lifetime achievement award with the AIA um, chapter raising all the money um, for us. And I would work with the architects to choose objects to um, enter the collection under um, their honor. And um, it shouldn't surprise any of you that um, the older generation who at the time when we started in, in two, the early 2000s was already sort of pushing 90, um, our initial meeting, every single one of them said, I want a Bauhaus, you know, or metal chair. Um, so we were able to acquire a lot of uh, those, but um, I'm so delighted to say that as the years have gone on, we've really broadened um, the kinds of objects that you see here. Um, so it goes from about 1890 to, uh, to 2000. And I think that's an important also um, record of our collection is that we're, we really are, are actively uh, trying to do a lot of media. Um, this collaboration drew the attention of uh, an incredible woman named Margot Grant Walsh, who was Art Gensler's first hire for Gensler. Um, she lives in New York City. She had lived in Houston you know, 30 years ago, and she, Margot had developed an incredible collection of metalwork, but had a specialty in um, metalwork designed by architects. And she gave us that collection of uh, almost 60 pieces, and here's a, a view from an exhibition that we did, and it it's went from Wiener Werkstatt and Ashby and Macintosh all the way up through, you know, Vignelli and Salt's Ass. Um, another, you know, quick thing, there are the Holy Grail pieces that you wait an entire lifetime as a curator and you may not ever be able to cross those off your wish list, but um, we have been able to do so. Um, this is uh, Jean Prouvé, um, dining chair, one of six that he made for his sister, Marianne. Um, not your typical uh, production prouvé. You know, one of the most amazing opportunities in my entire career is, uh, you know, was the ability to acquire this 1920 Rietveld chair in its original you know, condition. It had gone through two years of conservation because it had been overpainted. Um, and, you know, I don't even have to, to describe to your audience, you know, how significant this is for us. And, you know, these kinds of major acquisitions are not only for the design department, but, you know, we look at them as dovetailing with the larger collections. And so, you know, this chair has been exhibited with design, but also with, you know, Mondrian and Husnar and also with Torres Garcia, uh, because there's big connections between um, Uruguay and, um, and De Stile. Mm. Um, just last month, we acquired this um, Josef Hoffman dining chair from the Kukersdorf Sanatorium which is the only extant example retaining its original oil cloth upholstery. So the upholstery that you see um, on the other examples in museums and elsewhere, there was a cache of these chairs that came out in 1967. They were all upholstered in red leather, or red fabric. Um, for whatever reasons, this chair escaped that fate. Um, it descended in Hans Holine's collection and we bought it from his daughter. So this is, again, another one of those kinds of holy grail things. And, and I have a, a ever never ending list of holy grail objects. And, um, you know. Do you actually have a, a list, Cindy? Like, do you yeah. have <laughs> <laughs> actually, to in 20 years. We'll see what else I've been able to do. A more serious question I had just in reference to the Rietfeld is whether you're actively looking at moments of potential connection, which this one is an obvious one, obvious, you know, to Ben Dosberg, Mondrian, and other de style artists. Um, but is that a, a factor that sort of weighs on the scales when you decide whether to acquire something, if you know that it will talk well to other aspects of this comprehensive museum collection? Absolutely. And, um, you know, we increasingly um, exhibit things uh, with multimedia and in our new building, which you'll see an image of just at the end, 
the second floor of the new building has department specific galleries, but the third floor is entirely integrated installation. So not only do we do that, you know, all of us are doing that. And, and in our um, acquisition presentations, we are highlighting the connections with other media um, and aspects of, of the larger you know, art history. Very much the way things are going in general in American museums. Lack yeah, of yeah, doing everything in a totally non-departmental way. Yeah, and we've 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 been doing it for a long time, um, and so it's it's almost uh, it's not unusual, you know, within our processes. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, like everyone else, uh, at the beginning of collection development, there were people that we uh, I really wanted to focus on um, as as markers for the collection. Um, Salt sauce for a variety of of well known reasons. Um, we have production works, we have some of his photography, we have one of a kind things like the totem, um, some of the very limited early pieces. Uh, we had this incredible opportunity to acquire one of a kind early ceramics from the estate uh, after he passed away. And this um, was something that uh, I worked with Barbara Radice on, on choosing specific pieces. So we now have nine of these pieces from the 50s and, and into the 60s, um, which is really amazing. Um, Pesce, another one, we acquired our first piece in a prototype directly from him in 1998 and continue to acquire more works. Andrea Bronzi, um, we started small in 2000 with the, these production amnesi vases and have continued to collect his work, you know, through the radical design into the, you know, 80s and 90s and now up to today, including, um, and we are increasingly trying to acquire drawings and collages by um, many of the designers that we uh, acquire from or collect so that we can have more layered um, installations in the same way that we layer in textiles or, or other media. Um, Kermat has been a very interesting example for us. Um, the glass chair was something I acquired in, in 2009. I had been a big Kermat fan. And then interestingly, um, a collector here in Houston who was collecting on his own and kind of really resistant actually to uh, any uh, museum advice, fell in love with Kuramata um, and assembled a, a, a fabulous collection of the production works, some of which you see here. When he passed away, he left um, all of those to us and uh, his foundation has been supporting acquisitions of Kuramata that are, um, the kinds of, of smaller, limited works that he didn't necessarily have access to. So that's been a, another connection as to why we've been um, doing that. And Larman, um, you know, we have a, a bone rocker and have kind of come all the way up through. We were a, a venue on the show and, and I had the opportunity to write for the catalog and in yours is someone we will continue to, to commit to, uh, you know, going onward as he has really just begun as, uh, as everyone knows. Yeah, he was our, our last guest yes. days ago yeah. and I was almost appalled to learn that he had only just turned 40. I know, <laughs> it's so <laughs> depressing. You know, when he was here and he did this terrific lecture and all of that, people just, you know, first of all, he's young, he looks even younger. And I can't tell you the number of people who came up and were like so depressed and said, we feel like we have achieved nothing. <laughs> 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 it's like Tom Lehrer saying about Mozart, um, how depressing it was that when Mozart was hit, his age had been dead for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but can I ask you a, a more serious question about the um, collecting of artists in depth or designers indeed? In yeah. Depth. Uh -huh. uh, so well, as you're, here's one of our bronzy pieces, so, yeah. So good example, Bronzy, somebody that you collected in a lot of depth. Um, are there other processes that kick into motion when you're doing that to do with archival uh, information capturing or kind of building a network around the artist? Can you talk a little bit about what happens when you decide to commit to somebody at the level of six, 10, 15 objects and how that's different? Sure. 
yes, I mean, there's there's a desire for greater um, for greater connections. Um, so you know, I've been to Andrea's studio a number of times. I've interviewed him. I had the opportunity to interview Salt Sass. Um, Kuramata is really the one that you know I've never had the chance to um, to interact with. But yes, there there is a desire. You know, I'm not trying to be completist because there's really that's not the goal. The goal is to represent um, a broad aspect of their design, whether it's in different media, different timetables, be able to show evolution. It's part of the reason why I'm so interested in the drawings uh, or collages and whether they're preparatory or finished or just an artistic expression. Um, so there is definitely that aspect. And um, Pache is another one, you know, I've done numerous studio visits with, he's lectured at the museum. Um, so there, there is definitely a desire for a greater um, interaction, but a greater record um, and, and capturing where someone is in a particular moment of time um, in terms of their present work, but also their reflections on past work. And so that's something that is really important. Mm -hmm. Okay. For to do that in a first person way, in addition to, you know, building the library of materials, monographs, articles, what have you, but but to also record it in a first person way. And I, I suppose this idea of presenting design process to your visitors through a focus on somebody like that, that also informed your decision to emphasize prototypes, which is another particular strength of the collection. Yes, absolutely. Um, we find that our visitors are really interested in process. And so from the late 1990s, I've been collecting um, prototypes and oftentimes production pieces. So here's the prototype for, um, for one of the tree pieces um, from Andrea that we collected. Um, there's that Peche chair, our first Peche acquisition, which is a Pratt chair prototype. We have since um, done a production one. But with the production one, rather than asking Gaetano to make one for us, I wanted to wait for one that would relate to ours from the time. And so we were able to acquire um, a, a production Pratt chair from his very first show at Peter Joseph Gallery um, mm -hmm. of the Pratt chairs. The Geary um, dining chair prototype, another, um, er, this is a, a prototype handmade by one of the collaborators in um, Geary's office, Jack Brogan, that came from his, uh, his estate. With Marcel, um, you know, even with the objects that everyone knows, um, like the Rosenthal early, you know, the, the Drogue collaboration with Rosenthal that, that then he, went on to do, we collected the prototypes um, for these. So you can see the egg vase initially with its foot. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, that was the initial sponge vase, um, not the, the flattened one that, uh, that we all know now. Um, and then more recently, um, the cause Campana collaboration, the uh, prototype which had um, metal legs instead of the the wood legs that um, ended up going for the addition. So sorry, um, not, on yeah. that piece, the cause uh, Campana collaboration. So that's the very first chair that they made together. Is that right? Or the so first? So there were. Um, so yes, there were four chairs made um, with these specific BFF dolls. One for. The Campanas, one for cause, and I can't remember where the third one is, and then there was this one. Mm -hmm. But the initial one, because all of the Campana stuffed animal chairs had metal legs, so it was done on metal legs, and then uh, they decided they wanted to have it uh, on wooden legs instead. It's interesting because when you focus on prototypes, uh, or you know, the very first moment of production even uh, prior to further refining, as would be the case with Peche's Pratt chair, for example. Um, you actually are, in a funny way, reinstating some of the connoisseurship issues that we talked about with Alto and Mies at the beginning of the conversation, but applying them to contemporary production. Mm -hmm. like, kind of being opportunistic about getting the most special uh, 
um, or most indicative early example? Yeah, and I found um, a lot of contemporary designers are very conflicted about their prototypes. Mm -hmm. um, there's a significant number of them who don't want their prototypes out in the world, um, even with the understanding that you know it's educational because they see them more as failures of process um, or you know things that aren't quite right to them. Uh, so I have been unsuccessful uh, along the way with trying to get prototypes, but there are also um, designers who are amenable to it and who see the value of that um, being in a museum um, and see them as fully realized objects, just uh, objects that are fully realized along the creativity route or production route. Mm. Okay. So that's been interesting. Um, I think that, uh, you know, just kind of winding up very quickly, um, you know, our interest, Italian radical right now is, we're all about it. Um, it's something I've been collecting for a long time. Uh, it's just a particular passion of mine. And I've always been struck by the fact that very few museums have been interested in it. So here's some of the, you know, both production and, you know, the rare, uh, Holy Grail pieces that uh, we've been able to acquire. Um, and then, of course, um, Dennis Friedman's collection, and I'll show you the exhibition that we have on view right now, which got extended to July 5th, which is terrific. Great. Um, we acquired um, a big chunk of his Italian uh, radical collection, ranging from um, the kind of uh, more well-known pieces and I have to say that Dennis as a collector collects like I do as a curator so he's all the way about the very early examples in original condition um, so here's some of those but I think more significantly in some ways is um, to answer another way an earlier question of yours our museum is a very weak almost non-existent collection of arte povera and there were great connections between Italian Radical and Arte Povera during the period with um, a number of artists, architects, and designers kind of having one foot in both movements. And so Dennis had collected a number of these pieces. You know, these are one of a kind or one of two that are made um, along the lines of, of the Arte Povera principles. And um, so I made it a priority to acquire those. Um, and you can see uh, some of those here, as well as a, a you know, piece of Italian surrealist furniture. Um, and then again, trying to get the really rare, limited things. The Mendini chair is one of six that he made for a dining set. Um, Lapo Benassi, strengthening our salt sauce collection with um, pieces that he did for uh, alchemia, which was believe it or not, a hole in our salt sass, our previous salt sass collection, and some pieces that kind of um, broaden it. So Ugo La Pietra's sculpture or the Archizum painted panel here in my attempts and desires to broaden things. And here's our exhibition um, installed in our Mies Cullinan Hall. Um, the show is traveling to Yale in fall of 2021. So hopefully uh, some of you Northeasters will get to see it. Uh, the idea for the pavilion was based on Art Kazoom's unrealized models um, as part of No Stop City, um, in which they had these uh, you know, model maquettes of infinity rooms. And so um, as you come in the main doors of the Mies uh, Pavilion, this is what you uh, come up and then go up into the stairs in the, um, the exhibition proper. And it is uh, a mirrored infinity room. Mm. It's, it, there's kind of a, the architects here have been sort of getting off on it because there's this whole meta moment where uh, we have a Mies international style building Arkazoom's No Stop City was in rebellion to that, and we've inserted this, you know, Arkazoom inspired pavilion and a Mies pavilion. And anyway, it, it's been, it's, it's an incredible experience as well as a, a great way for us to install the objects so you can really move along through them. It's just as meta and self-referential as the radical design show. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And you know, we are one of two museums that Mies uh, designed that were ever built, uh, the other one being in Berlin. So I mean, 
the new pavilion in Boa. It was just like a dream come true that we could we could do this installation and have that that extra level of uh, frisian, if you will. Um, be no that maybe the, um, sorry, I was just going to say it might be nice for your uh, colleagues who are responsible for collecting Arte de Povera to feel like there's no pressure on them to increase the holdings in that area, given that this design has entered the collection. So that yeah, no, it is. I mean, it's something we recognized as a weakness. Fortunately, there's a, a great Arte Povera collection in Houston that we, uh, you know, we borrow from and, and hopefully will come to us. Um, but yes, it is, uh, you know, those are the kinds of dialogues that we have been happening, having. And so, you know, when I was presenting to the uh, trustees the acquisition of Dennis's collection, which was gift and purchase, you know, I was able to have my colleagues in contemporary art speak up for the importance of this from their perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, that we really do um, very frequently in terms of, we're, we're Peter Marzio always, um, wanted our museum to be one collection. We're not a, a fiefdom of individual departments. And so we really do come together and think of it as a, as a giant collection. Mm -hmm. I know we're running out of time, so I'm just gonna end with um, our lighting collection, which you know, since 2000, I've been wanting to do an international lighting show. Happy to say that Sarah Schleining and I have been working hard for a few years. It's gonna open in Houston in February of 2021, and then fall, uh, travel to the high after that for former institution. But lighting is something, um, again, prototypes and production and rare and you know the whole gamut we've been collecting um, from late 19th, or, or sorry, early 20th century up to contemporary, and that will be um, featured in this traveling show. So just a few examples from our collection we have, um, you know, probably about 30 different lamps, maybe more at this time. And um, the, the previously mentioned, this is our, our building. Um, Stephen Hall designed, it's a building for only modern and contemporary art. I mentioned the way the galleries are being dispersed. Um, we are on schedule to open to the public on November 1st. Um, construction still gets to go ahead in coronavirus in Texas. Uh, it's a, directly across the street from the Mies building, Caddy Corner to the Maneo Beck building. And you can see in the background um, Stephen Hall's uh, art school, the LaSalle School of Art that we uh, opened about two years ago. And um, this has given me the opportunity to work on my very first artist commission. And I know you talked uh, with Sarah and others about um, the commissions that they do. It's, it's not an area that I have um, done any work on, honestly, until um, this one. And uh, our sculptures from Mr. Choi are here in Houston, um, ready to be installed in this uh, beautiful, uh, one of the water gardens um, entrances to the museum. So uh, that's been, the building is offering a lot of new curatorial opportunities, not only our first ever permanent um, design, craft and decorative arts galleries, but, and, and a full floor of integration, um, but also for me, um, an artist's commission. And that's such a perfect commission too, because it's sort of halfway between uh, the Chinese scholars rock and, um, you know, Michelangelo's slaves or you know, some kind of, you know, figural sculpture. So, um, well, that was absolutely amazing, Cindy. Well done. 25 years and 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it actually it does leave us some time for questions. And we have a couple. Uh, first, Mark McDonald had a very focused question. And Mark, I will say, uh, the great um, dealer, uh, formerly of 5050, is going to be a guest on the show in June, in fact. So here's Great. a moment to hear from him in advance. But Mark, and, you and thank you, Mark. And Mark grew up in Houston. So, you know, he's, he's known this museum for a lot longer than I have. And Cindy, if you can stop sharing your screen, we can see you better too. Oh, okay. Yep. Mark, Mark, what's your question? Hi, Cindy and Catherine. So great to see you, Catherine. Um, I just wanted to say congratulations to you both for all the things that you did, for the rigor and the focus of your collecting passion that really brought Houston into a, the, just into the mainstream, if not the forefront of uh, collecting 20th century and 21st century. I first started going to the museum 
1961 when I was 10, when the Mies uh, uh, building was just fresh. And I remember loving more than anything the big soft fan by Klaus Oldenburg, which I guess in the long run makes sense because it was the closest thing to a piece of furniture or a machine at least in the museum that I got to see when I was a kid and I always remember that. Uh, but I'm just curious, I think that one thing that you guys did so well um, was to cultivate the collector group. And I remember names like Bill Stern and Brian Ronemeyer, was that his name? Um, who had been uh, Houstonians um, who were instrumental. Just talk for a second about those guys. Sure. Um, yeah, you know, I think that uh, one of the things that any curator needs to do, no matter where you are, is cultivate your local audience. I mean, none of this happens without grassroots support. And I mean, not only, uh, you know, funding or donating acquisitions, but having people come to your lectures and your tours and, and your exhibitions, you know, foot traffic matters. And um, I was sort of everywhere I could be um, for you know, a really long time and, and sort of you know, in my own chamber of commerce for, uh, for building, you know, our design collection. And we are the only museum in Houston that collects or shows design. Um, people like Bill Stern, who's a legendary architect um, here in Houston, was also a design collector. Um, you know, those are the kinds of people that when I first moved here, I would hear names and then I would um, have introductions to and get to know. And, you know, many of these people have become uh, lifelong friends um, and have offered their, their historical knowledge, not only um, about their own activities, but the kinds of activities that happened in Houston. We had a really early Knoll showroom, as you know. Um, you know, we had mid-century modern subdivisions and design shops that were carrying imports as well as the Herm Miller um, and other American designs. We had department stores uh, and furniture stores. Um, you know, one of the biggest furniture stores, Star Furniture, um, you know, which is a, a big sort of general furniture store, they showed Geary's Easy Edges in 1970 for one year. And in the late 60s, we're showing Italian design. So there, there was a history here that wasn't well known, but the more and more I met these people, you know, some of them never collected themselves, but um, the architects actively used objects in their practice. And, right. and that's been part of the joy of, of being in a community for 25 years. Uh, you know, I'm kind of rare amongst my colleagues to have stayed in one place for so long. Um, and to, to, through our friends group, you know, also to still get to know people, but our collaboration with AIA Houston has just been seminal to introduce us to a lot of the figures that you're, um, that you're mentioning. Yeah. It's a great um, reminder of how uh, special design curating is too, because it connects with all of these trades and professions in ways that perhaps other parts of the museum uh, don't always. Um, we have a question from John Prown from the Chipstone Foundation in Milwaukee. John, are you out there? I am out there. Hey. How's it going? <laughs> in in more than one there? sense, yes. <laughs> Hi. What's your question, John? Um, so building on that, Cindy, on the curatorial question, one of the things one of the difficulties we have as deck arts curators, design curators, is we put out the coolest looking things on the planet, many of them being functional objects. And then we say to the visitors, you can't touch them, you can't use them, you can't experience them. And I was just curious over your experience, how, you know, how do you bring questions about function into or, or how does it affect your ideas about design and how you communicate information about design objects? Because we, we often don't hear. So I th you were breaking up a bit, John, but I think you're asking me how do we communicate, you know, function and, and those kinds of issues in design? Is that, yeah. is that what I was hearing? So um, we do that on a, a number of different levels. So, um, 
you know, we have uh, docent tours um, of, of all permanent collection as well as special exhibitions. And um, those are common questions. And so I always try and layer in that kind of information in our docent tours. Uh, what the priority is of, of function or not. Um, if it is a piece that, uh, you know, is a, a mass produced thing that I may have sat in myself, uh, you know, I can offer um, that kind of information. We don't have um, a study collection at the museum. We don't have, um, objects that people can touch and sit in. Uh, I think it's extremely confusing to the public um, for that. It's just a personal opinion, so that's something we don't do. Um, but we try and layer it in with labels, with our docent tours, um, if there's you know any audio um, done. And we will point people locally, you know, as, if there are objects that are carried in design shops um, in Houston, we'll point people to those shops and encourage them to go and sit in a chair um, or, or what have you. You know, one of the things that we did for a long time is we did these uh, exhibitions that would travel to various public libraries in our county. And those exhibitions, when it came to the design ones, um, because it was objects really, as opposed to furniture, um, I particularly curated ones that would feature everyday household goods from the collection so that people would understand um, they could, when they went to you know, Target where we have bought things for the collection or, um, other shops like that, that when they're faced with a, you know, a huge row of vacuum cleaners um, and we're showing them our Dyson and why, we, why it's an important design object, that they can start to use their own eye to make choices, you know, whether it's a coffee pot or uh, you know, a camera or what have you. And so those are some other um, ways where we have been engaging that kind of dialogue with our broadest um, audience as opposed to um, the more design specific audience. Mm. So again, they're uh, really anchoring into the way that design connects to people's everyday lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Uh, there's so much more we could talk about. And um, Cindy, I just have to tip my cap to you for everything that you've achieved at Houston and everything that you're about to with this new building opening up. It's super exciting. Great that MFA is already open to the public. I hope you're all staying safe down there and will continue to do so. Um, I will just uh, let people know that we have uh, another very significant figure from the world of design museums, indeed the design museum itself in London because Dan Sujic is going to be uh, our guest on Monday. Uh, so that will be absolutely fascinating and it'll be great to hear from him uh, just a few months after he has retired. Uh, from his long and successful tenure as co-director of the Design Museum. And then on Wednesday, we'll have the artist Daniel Arsham joining us, which will be super exciting as well. So please come on back on Monday. And otherwise, um, Cindy, you very much demonstrated the value of uh, the playing the long game. <laughs> so, <laughs> it is. It's, it's thanks, all yeah. about the long game. Thank you for having me. And, um, you know, I hope when travel is possible again that um, will convince you all to come down to Houston, especially after our new building is up and um, you'll be able to see the, the full breadth of the design collection of which you've, you've seen a taste now. It's, it's really exciting for us because um, I think people are going to be really surprised at uh, what we've been doing um, and uh, there's a lot to see. So everyone stay safe. Thank you, and uh, looking forward to seeing you all sometime in person. <laughs>